with all the anniversaries and the new albums, we can really probably pull this off every year for a little while now. So. <laughs> That's true. We'll have a new record next year. So there you go. There we go. Let's put it in the diary now. Well, I want to start, though, with, uh, with version 2.0, because I got so excited when I saw that this was the 20th anniversary year and there was going to be a big celebration. Uh, this is the record that you've called that you think is the quintessential garbage record, right? Yes. Yes, I, I do, actually. Yeah. So, I sort of thought that too, because I mean, that first record, and I think I'm just really echoing things I read from you in the book anyway, but that first record was, was you guys finding your feet. This was the first record where you were a real band and everybody was firing on all cylinders. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. We had sort of, you know, I mean, history sort of speaks for itself. We sort of fell together, you know, as a band. And then we toured the first record for almost two years. And at the end of that tour, we were you know, bolstered by the success, excited by the success and the possibility of making another record. And we sort of went into the studio with a lot of swagger. And um, I think you can hear that on the record. It's one of my favorite things about this period for you all is that you were sort of an accidental band who never really knew if you were going to take yourself seriously as a band. And suddenly you're one of the biggest bands in the world. Kyle, we're accidental people. What can I tell you? <laughs> it's... Um, I mean, yeah, it was, it was so peculiar and so unexpected. None of us ever really sought the kind of fame that ended up coming our way. It wasn't something that we were ambitiously, you know, striving for at all. And so, yeah, to find ourselves, you know, on mainstream television and on the front covers of magazines was really surreal. I can't imagine what that's like. I mean, you know... It's uh, ghastly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite ghastly. <laughs> I think there was, a, there was one story of you saying you were walking through the airport and it was just your face everywhere. And I was mortified. I mean, I was genuinely mortified. I was just like, this is the most uncomfortable thing that's ever happened to me. And I, was, I felt sort of sweaty, you know, and sort of mildly panicked. And, uh, yeah, I can't say we were very comfortable in that kind of limelight, as it turns out. I think we all felt a little self-conscious. And I hate to use this word, cause it's, but I think it's, it's, it's probably appropriate for how we felt. We felt it was a bit vulgar. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that it was an obscene amount of attention and it felt vulgar. What, I, what was nice and endearing about reading about that time was still how much of... I don't know, is fangirl the right word? Because you're meeting all these amazing artists and, and you're, you have no, but even today, you're like, oh my God, I was hanging out with Nick Cave, you know, and oh my God, you know, David Bowie came into our life. And I saw this as like, yeah, but you, because you were on their level, you know, everybody was that level. And I don't know. I was, was never on the same level as David Bowie or Nick Cave. I can assure you, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you're right. We were mingling with our heroes and that was extraordinary. And I mean, don't get me wrong, there was lots of gorgeous things that came with that kind of success. You know, we had access to anything and anybody and that can be very thrilling, you know. So yeah, I don't want to sound too jaded because there was so much of it was so great fun, you know, and the most important thing was just that we were playing sold out shows all over the world. That that was extraordinary, you know, and I wouldn't swap that out for the world. But all the rest of the stuff that sort of came along with the success, the musical success, was, you know, uninvited and, and, and certainly not well tolerated by any of us. Of course, I can say, though, that the most interesting part, and, and we should really concentrate on this too, was the music itself, because what a great record, and, and, and still how it stands up. My wife was asking last night, because I've been listening to the record a lot in the last week, week and a half, to kind of prepare and everything. And she said, you know, does it, does it sound different now than it does? And I said, you know, it's interesting because so many records from that period, those were really coming of age years for me. You know, they have changed in various ways. Some of them are dated. Some of them just change meanings. And this is one of the ones I feel like I can still connect to in the exact same way. Well, that is a fine compliment. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it was a very forward-thinking record at the time. You know, it's it's hard to imagine now that we're 20 years down the line, but when we made that record, nobody had made digital recordings yet, really. And we were certainly one of the first bands to, you know, to utilise a lot of the new, fresh technology that the computer technology brought into the music, musician's universe, you know. 
And as a result, uh, I think that you can hear that on the record. It's sort of very different sounding to a lot of the records that came out around that time and really, really stood out and I think captured people's imaginations sonically. Because uh, what it was possibly one of the first records to be recorded completely in Pro Tools, yet there's still so much soul in those songs and that could have easily been lost. That's, I think that's one of the most surprising things about this record. Yeah, I mean, I think some of that, what you refer to, is actually just incompetence. <laughs> so, so we're using a lot of the technology, but we were literally, it was, we were a testing vessel almost, you know, and we had a lot of direct contact with the, the tech companies at that time. And we were, yeah, just beta testing, you know, pieces of equipment. And so there's a lot of mistakes still on that record that nowadays would be cleaned up, you know, and, and uh, therefore you'd probably, the record would sound much cleaner and, and, and more sterile. But there's still this sort of analog approach and still a lot of, like, as I said, sort of errors that um, give that, that there's a certain kind of life that version 2.0 has. And as think. far as the lyrics, though, I mean, this was... Because this was the first one that you, I, I don't know how you say it, became full on fronting the band. Like this was all you on the microphone. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I certainly took a much more aggressive, a more dominant position, I think is probably fair to say. Because after my experience with the first record, I realized that I was going to be held accountable for absolutely every word that was on our record. And I was determined to be able to stand behind anything that came out of my mouth. And therefore, generally speaking, you know, I, I wanted it to be my own words. And I'm very lucky that I work with three individuals who have been willing to compromise and willing to, you know, put their their own lyrical bent aside in order to make me feel uh, that I am being authentic and true to myself. You know, it's very generous of them um, because they are all capable of writing great songs themselves. But... I think one of the reasons our band has been successful is that it is it, it we are an authentic group. You know, we're sort of like an old school band. We function that way, and it's it's allowed us to flourish in in ways and, and thrive in ways that other bands, you know, have been destroyed by the pressures that that come with success and come with a continuing career as a band you know because you're all bound together it's very frustrating a lot of the time for the individual because the individual has to serve the, the group dynamic and that can be very challenging sometimes so when you're listening back then and and i assume you've had to a bit more than than usual to a record like this are there still songs that resonate the way they did then now <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm very proud of this record. I, I, I love it. You know, I'm, I've got nothing but great feelings towards the songs, and um, I can still relate to a lot of the the stuff that we wrote about. You know, that we wrote about and covered in that record, and you know, right off the top of my head, you know, Paranoid and Pusher are two of my favourite songs that we've ever written. Um, yeah, I, I still relate very much to Hammering and The Trick Is To Keep Breathing, I think, is a classic. You know, I think we've got a little classic in that, that song. So, yeah, I've, 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 I can stand by my record proudly. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so so he, here's, here's where, of course, everything, uh, you know, changes a bit uh, on that part of things because when you look back on, on this time and not just, you know, the 20 years and, and the music... But it's, of course, also the way the industry has changed. And, and it's so bizarre because, again, reading the book, we know now all the shit that you had to deal with back then. But reading about that and seeing the way the industry has changed now, I mean, do you see that it's finally becoming a bit more positive? Oh, God, no. The music industry is a hellhole. <laughs> Make no mistake. Um, you know, to be honest, it's, it's an industry that has built itself around creative. And its whole purpose is to exploit the artist. That's just how they make money. And they're really good at it. And that will never change. You know, if, if a record company is any good, they'll be exploiting you at every turn. That's their job, you know. And that, that dynamic will never change. Not really. Otherwise, people aren't going to want to build businesses around creatives. If they don't get full, like, you know, crack at, at the whip, so to speak, they're not going to be interested. So yeah. no. there you have it. I was hoping, you know, in, in one sense that um, there's a bit more power in the artist's own hands these days to get their music out in ways that, 
you know, would have been impossible, uh, you know, in the 90s and, and for half of the 2000s at least without the support of uh, a label major or mini major or something like that. Well, you see, it's a double-edged sword because, you know, when the Internet first sort of, you know, sprouted its wings, you know, and we were all very excited as artists that we could, you know, upload our music for free and be without a label and be without a distribution company, et cetera, et cetera. It was, it was it, for a brief moment, it was fantastic. And it did empower the musician. But now the, you know, with streaming services and this, that, and the next thing, you know, basically what's happening is these big conglomerates, these corporate monsters have cut deals with all these streaming services and so on, and they still make up vast amount of money, but it's not distributed to the artist. And now that any old artist can upload material onto the internet, all the all the great stuff can easily get drowned out in literally a nanosecond. So in order to stick out, you really do need a support network. And so you're sort of you get an offer that you can't refuse. Basically, it's like either you know there's the tiny, tiny, minuscule possibility that you'll have a breakthrough record. But that's a t- you know a tiny percentage. Or you join forces with a record label and just a- allow yourself to be grossly exploited on the off chance that they can break your record. You know, and for a brief moment, if you if you if your record is broken, it seems worthwhile to have been exploited like that. But then, of course, if you if you manage to carve out a career for yourself for any length of time, that's when the problems really begin because all of a sudden it doesn't feel so great to be so grossly exploited. You know, you make it sound also glamorous being a rock oh star. yeah it's oh yes the glamour in the music industry is is extreme i mean obviously you've got you know you've got the upper class you've always got the upper class who do extraordinarily well and do live a gl- glamorous life and do make insane amounts of money and there will always be artists like that you know the biebers and the beyonces and the amazing rihannas you know they're extraordinary creatures and and you know they've got vast amounts of talent i'm not i'm not knocking them at all but you know that's what i call the upper class there is no middle class at all in the music industry. It's either all or nothing. And you've got this this incredibly large working class of musicians who don't really, you know, make very much money and are holding down other jobs. You know, all the young musicians that I meet now, they're, they're holding down two or three jobs as well as touring, as well as making records. You know, it's tough, man. It's really tough out there. While, while we're on such happy subjects, uh, I'll put on another one here. <laughs> you can always rely on me to, to drag everybody's spirits down. No, it's, it, it, and I, and, you know what? I'm going to use what you said there here in just a minute. I'll, I'll build into it because backing up again and, and in similar theme, it is also ludicrous to look back on that and think, oh, it was a thing that you all were a band that was three guys and a girl. And everybody made a point of pointing that out. And you had to deal with being, you know, a woman fronting a guy. Well, just a woman in rock, I guess, is is, is the real way to say that. And and I know there's an easy line, especially, by the way, as music was getting more dude rock at the time, that had yeah. to be just stupid for you to have to deal with on a daily basis. It could, yeah, I mean, that's fair, I guess. There were some very, very stupid moments that I had to sort of try and push through. But again, you know, I, I felt gratitude and privilege that I had even got to this point. And I think that's what kept me marching forward. I was just like, I realized how rare it was to be a woman in this environment. And I was grateful, you know. So you just sort of muscle through and just try not to let it get to you too much. Well, I'll ask a similar question the several movements that that are happening that are finally putting a lot of this conversation into the you know the the forefront and the context do you see that these changes are finally happening for the better you know i'm very grateful to the me too movement i feel like it has started a conversation that really desperately needs to be had you know i guess what leaves me a little despondent is that i feel like our culture has just sort of looked at the me too movement as a quote unquote female issue And my perspective on this is actually it's a male issue that we are discussing here. And why so few men have entered into the discussion in any positive, empathetic, supportive way surprises me. Because I feel like we are talking about y'all's midden. This is a mess that you have all made and we need to clean this up. You know, you need to get your fellow brothers to like toe the line. Because the statistics are extraordinarily shocking. And I, I know all the good men that I know and love are kind of horrified and, and, and genuinely shocked 
that it's one in three women and one in seven men who like experience some form of you know male aggression whether that's sexual or otherwise, you know, and uh, that's an extraordinary statistic that really demands our attention and, and, and really calls for some close examination that this has to stop. This is not right. Obviously, being a guy that's asking this question and everything, and I know how that can be because it's always awkward on my end, no matter how much I think I'm the good guy in the equation, because I know I've been guilty of it at parts, even if I can't remember. And it's embarrassing because... As you say, it is us, you know, no matter what I try to say, it's still us. Yeah, and it's all of us, you know, too. It's our whole society and what we choose to tolerate and what we don't speak up about. And, you know, I just think that's what's so great about the Me Too movement. It is giving us all an opportunity to really talk about these kind of very difficult, challenging, scary, you know, awkward, you know, topics, you know. Well, I always love that you're... Uh, as the phrase goes, putting your money where your mouth is, because uh, you've been um, well, one of the many things uh, I'll say uh, with music festival equality. That's that's a that's a big thing you're championing right now, right? Yeah, I mean, definitely. And I just champion women, to be honest. And because I'm a musician, then you know my immediate attention sort of falls into my own sphere. But I want just things to be better. I want women to have a more equal representation. You know across the board and that in particular we have to focus on women of of color and black women and you know the opportunities that they are currently you know enjoying are are so few and far between and it's so wrong well i I see the changes out there and and i'll go back to that one specifically i know there's been one festival losing the name of it but uh you know that's already pledged that it's going to be you know, as 50-50 as they can get it. And and that's great to see that people are reacting right away, you know, so the steps yeah. are being moved I, And I appreciate that, you know, because I think each gesture has power in it and puts pressure on other festivals to do the same. And I understand that, you know, a lot of people are like, well, this is ridiculous, you know, and, and they sort of blow off about positive discrimination and, and they're very offended by it. But I do believe as I've gotten older that unless we incorporate positive discrimination, then we'll never change anything. You know, we, we, people need a hand, a leg up, and we have to start somewhere. And otherwise, you know, the representation, female representation will remain as it is. So, yes, I think it's great to, to really make these pledges. And I know for a fact there's plenty of talent out there and when people tell me that the public it's we're simply you know we're just simply giving the public what they want I totally totally disagree with that the public will take what they're given for the most part from the curators of art you know because they don't know what else they could be getting they just are offered up acts on a festival bill and I don't think for one second they're they're thinking well what's behind the curtain what didn't you give me today instead they're like this is awesome you know we're having a time of our lives these great bands and everyone's drinking and partying and having a great time so I just don't believe that the public don't want to hear female musicians I'm sorry I just I, I find that just a ludicrous argument well it doesn't take that far to even prove that wrong too because you know you, you got the guy on the Grammys the guy who runs the Grammys saying that Neil Portnoy. Yeah, that horrible line that he said. And, and then, you know, just look at any top 10 list. You know, close your eyes and pick any, uh, you know, magazine or, or website or whatever and top 10 list. And what you're going to find is it's predominantly women artists creating the most interesting stuff. And, and that's, like I said, just look at any of them. And, and for him to say something like that, it's like, dude, what music world are you living in? <laughs> Well, he definitely, Neil Portnoy made a very ill-advised comment for sure and really, you know, revealed himself for the old, out-of-touch misogynist that he is. I'm very surprised he remains in that position, actually, because he's already shown all his cards. You know, we know how he thinks. He's not a uh, female-identifying artist ally. Just full stop, you know. But in some ways, I'm, I, I was relieved when he made that kind of silly comment because it's sort of proof that that's what women are up against. You know, people can poo-poo us all they want, but the fact is these attitudes are prevalent in the music industry and, and they remain that way and have been like that, you know, since basically since rock and roll began. Mm. So, you know, we just have to keep pushing and hopefully things will change. And I do believe ultimately they will change. Well, I, believe in ev- I believe in evolution, Kyle. It looks like it's happening. That, that's the nice thing. And having you as a role model, uh, a mentor that I see is happening more and more out there as, as new artists, you know, 
uh, are created every day. Um, and the work you do with uh, the girls' school out in L.A., the mm-hmm. festival out there, I mean, that's the positive stuff. That's the stuff that's making a big change. And I think you're one of the best voices to have, uh, you know, on, on the megaphone out there. So all the compliments and, and praise. <laughs> Well, thank you. That's very generous and kind and sweet. But I can think of much better allies and and role models for them. But I'm all they've got right now. So they're just going to have to make do with me. Let me let me turn it just a little bit lighter, and, and I'm going to get back to the music too. But as you're looking at those um, at the new class, you know, as these artists coming up, do you do you see yourself in any of those or any any names specifically that you sort of go, oh yeah, no, I, I get you, I get what you're doing there. You know, I, this sounds like a weird thing to say, but I feel a kinship with any artist who emerges. You know, I can identify with their driver and their sort of driving spirit, you know, and their ambition and their longing. And so some artists are not necessarily do- making the kind of music that I personally would be excited by, but I still get excited by them, you know, as as figures, as people, as women, as, as little fighters, you know. And, and I, I don't know, I just, I, I want the very best for them all. I, I, I know how tough it is out there. It is a tough career in music you know it really is you don't have any job security you you don't get a pay packet at the end of every week you don't get insurance you, you know it's it's difficult you know and it remains difficult you know i've had a really long career at this point i've been making music for 35 years and it's still uncertain you know my future is always in in flux and that can be stressful on 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 people and i see a lot of frag- fragility amongst young artists particularly right now for some reason and i just want to protect them or at least put protections in place so that they have a better chance of weathering the the you know the storm that will inevitably hit them at some point during their career interesting that you're the second artist uh, i've talked to in the past 24 hours that used the word fragility when talking about uh, sort of similar themes. So, mm. yeah, right there it is. Yeah, they're funny times, you know. I, it, I think young artists now are so much more self-conscious than we were, you know. We didn't have any social media, so we had no, we had no interference in our lives or our kids, you know. Nobody could mess with our brains, but I think with social media, there's so much mind-effing <laughs> that goes on that I think it's, it remains very challenging for a young artist to hold together. I'm always saying that, hold, hold the line. You know, I'm always saying that to all my young, you know, young people that I meet who are artists. It's like you've got to hold the line. Yeah. And that is really hard when you get pushed up against every day in every way. Yeah. Well, again, having you be the person that tells them that uh, is a big up to begin with. Um, I don't know about that. I think <laughs> that's the problem is when you become old, which, I, of course, I am at this point, you know, young people just look at you like you're some kind of freaky freakazoid that came from outer space. You know, they, ca- they can't necessarily relate to you. And that's the problem, because I feel like in, in our culture, you know, older people do have something of value that if, if young people are really willing to listen, they can get some jewels of advice, you know, or or just methods of protection. But, yeah, I mean, that's the age-old dynamic between the young and the old. We're always sparring with one another and and dismissing each other, you know, and I just feel like I, I would continue to want to learn from young people. I think they've got a lot to teach me, but I, too, believe that young people have got a lot to learn. So stop, you yeah. know. They listen to the music. They They connect with your music, you know, however long ago that is, as we're celebrating that 20th anniversary of version 2.0. You know, it's, to me, you know, it, the elder versus kid argument, you're right, has been there forever. And it's, you know, listen to my wisdom. And they're like, you know, just go away and let us be us. But I find uh, maybe as an um, outside of not being an artist, you know, be, being on the part that I'm on and everything that it doesn't that part doesn't exist so much because for us, you know, we're listening to the music, we're connecting. So I think I always look up to the artists to kind of guide, you know, because that's, it was their art that I connected to. It was, it was, it was your art or, or, or Bowie's art or whoever's art that made me the person I am, you know, so that's, that's wide open ears right there. Well, I guess that's just mu- the power of music rather than the power of the musician. You know, I think music has got an ability to touch people regardless of their age. You know, it's, all, it's, it's something mysterious and mystic and, and strange that I don't think any of us have been able to figure out how it works, why it works and how powerful it is. But yeah, music's got an extraordinary ability to cross all genders, all creeds, you know, all religions, all colors, all everything. And that's what makes it so magnificent in a way. So you're taking this record out on the road. 
Uh, I will selfishly ask. Uh, I only see UK dates right now. Do you know if there's going to be any plans to, uh, to bring 2.0 to the States? There are some plans of food, but if and when we do it, it will be a very, very limited run because we, we, we toured last year and the year before, and this year is supposed to be us writing our new records. So mm. we're loath to take out too much time, but we understand that there's, there's been a, a somewhat of a frenzied demand from the fans. So we're going to try and, and put, put in a few dates. But yeah, it, it, it won't be an extensive tour, which is unlike us because we normally like tour for you know a year. But this will just be a matter of weeks. Yeah, well, I know that the last anniversary tour is sort of what got in the way of Strange Little Birds getting wrapped mm-hmm. up. So if it means yeah. that you guys are going to, you know, if it means more studio time to get the next record out, that that's fine. That's, <laughs> that's Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, the anniversary, the anniversary was always meant to just be something fun and just give give these records that meant so much to us a little cursory, you know, love. But yeah, it, it it must not become our main preoccupation. You know, it's always looking to the future. I think is good. Uh, I, I'd love to ask about the new record. You guys are recording uh, what out in California, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, in the yeah. desert. Well, we haven't actually accomplished that yet. That was the big plan. But for a, a lot of different reasons, we ended up going back to our studio in Atwater, which is where we always work. But in next month, we are planning to go back out to Palm Springs and we're going to live together. In a, and we haven't done this since the first record. We're all going to live under the one roof. And we're going to record during the day, then we're going to go out to dinner and then we come back and we're going to have band movie sessions, which is what we used to do back in the day. So this is the great plan. Whether we'll actually pull off or whether we'll all end up arguing and getting into our cars and heading back home, I'm not entirely sure. But that is the plan. And we're all pretty excited about it, actually. Yeah, because back then you didn't have a home to run off to. If it didn't work out, you were still stuck with each other. And now there's, there's that little out if you need to take it. That's right. That's right. Well, that's, the, that's very true. But uh, we, we're going to just see how we get along um, and use, using a different space and a different environment. And we've got some plans, you know, so mm-hmm. we'll see. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. I, I love the, the, the idea of that and the sound of that. I also am curious, you know, when, when the album eventually down the road finally gets recorded and finished, I know the desert can add, you know, some interesting moods and sounds to a song. I mean, even, you know, in Palm Springs, uh, I'd kind of be curious if that sort of snakes its way in there. Uh, I do say. hope so. Yeah. I do hope so. I, lo- I love that desert magic, but, you know... You never can tell. That's the thing. You know, you make all these big plans and then, you know, you get in a room with each other and, and you start playing and, and it just, you can't control it. Just cut, whatever happens, happens. And it's often so far removed from your plans. You know, it's funny. It's just how it goes. Well, either way, Shirley, I cannot wait to hear how it happens. Thank you, Kyle. Appreciate your support. This has been so much fun. I always have so much fun talking to you. Thank you for taking the time. <laughs> Thank you so much for your patience. <laughs> no patience at all. It's, uh, uh, it's all my honor. And um, you know, we'll do this again next year when there's a new record. All right. Yeah, it's in my, it's in my diary. <laughs> all right, great. You're on my dance card, Kyle. Thank you. All right, take care. Thank you, you so much. Bye. Bye.